I've got some more of that control kind of disruption error in here. Uh, and I'm, luckily, I go first. And as I've mentioned before, going first as a control Aridin or in general playing a control deck is really, really bad. When you want to play reactively and two, you usually have a lot of low tempo options. Uh, not very good, you know, solid, you know, uh, turns to be able to pass your opponent's strength. So I open up just by just playing a spy. Now, why am I playing a spy on the very first round? Uh, alternatively, I could have just passed here. But I'm playing this spy because I know uh, I, have a, I have a smite here. Uh, not smite, a uh, scorch. I have some weather that I can go in. I've effectively flipped the coin, so if I do end up actually going two cards down just to beat that, I'm pretty okay with that. So going forward, uh, alternatively, alternatively, as I said, also just dry passing is also an okay move. Because then you force it onto two rounds only, which means you can better funnel your weathers into that, that space. Although I don't necessarily want to give up control this round if I can help it. Also, <laughs> I was just testing out what he would play next to see if he was playing mill. And if he was playing mill, I just would have uh, forfeited immediately because I don't want to, you know, waste 30 minutes of my time playing against mill. But anyway, <laughs> so he plays out. He plays a spy back. This is not very good for me because I can't just pass here since my spy is higher than uh, the spy. I played is higher than the spy he played on my side. So if I pass here, then he'll just win the round on the same cards. If it was even, I would have taken it if it was even, I think. Because then we both would we both would have we both would have gone into round three, same cards, which is perfectly fine. That's even better for me because I can get all my weather on all three rows pretty reliably, uh, and he'll hemorrhage you know six points a turn. And even if he does manage to clear like two to three weathers, I'd still have like two to three more weathers. Uh, but regardless, if I was one point higher, I may have still passed. But uh, I go ahead and just play this out. So I I still want to take control of this round because when he plays his own spy back. He just says, like, basically what I just did was worthless. Nothing happened. But I need something to happen. I want this round to either end in my favor or I want it to. I want to go to the next rounds. I don't want to stick on this round too, too much. No, wait, I'm not explaining that well. I'm playing out an extra spy because I want to flip the coin because I want to be effectively going second. Even if it means I'm, I go down, <clears throat> excuse me, even if I do go down in points. And he gets a little bit tricky here. He <laughs> Emir is back a spy into his hand. Which is kind of funny. Okay, and then by this point, I just need to play my highest tempo option available. If I end up going for this little weather guy, I would have gone up to like 16. And 16 to 27 is pretty is a pretty difficult bridge to gap. So I'm gonna play out my highest uh, tempo option right now. First. And so effectively, now he's the one who has to go. He's effectively going first. And now he has to play to my tempo advantage. So I played this temp this card that didn't pass me over 25. But because I flipped a coin and I'm going second, quote unquote, he's the one who has to go one card down to try and pass me. So I don't I can play low tempo options and still be fine. I obviously don't want to play too low of a tempo option, but playing Woodland Spirit is just dandy. And then he uh, retaliates by playing out his spy again. He flipped the coin once again. <laughs> Just flipped the coin over and over and over again. Now, by this point, I'm going first again, quote unquote. Uh, this is really, this gets really, really tricky. It actually kind of reminds me of uh, the old folks will know. Back in closed beta, uh, there is this deck archetype. John Calvi used to, I think, turn all spies against you. He used to take all spies from the opposite side and put it on your own side of the board. <laughs> so having like, you know, three or four Cantarellas was a pretty normal sight. That deck was that deck was just crazy. I believe you can you can see uh, an example of that in the Gwent open beta or Gwent closed beta tournament, the two hundred fifty thousand dollar one with Life Coach, uh, the who of which Life Coach was the one doing that. Well, it's pretty good, pretty good tournament. Oh wait, I actually have a video up on this channel where I have the top five plays from that tournament. It was a good one. So going first, and I'm uh, qu quite a bit tempo above. If I had another spy, I totally would have played it, but I didn't. So I went with a low tempo play instead that will kind of set me up for later, uh, a for a longer round. Because now by this point, since I'm going first again, uh, flip, 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 going first again, I need to make sure I stay over his tempo advantage or pass. 
And since I don't want to pass yet, especially when I have weather on the field uh, that he just cleared, then I'm less inclined to drag it out. But I still have some more weather, so I'm going to play it out. And uh, just kind of like a relatively obvious thing, you don't want to just play your bronze weather. You want to be able to pull that out with your wild hunt hound, which is what I'm going to do next time. I have three wild hunt hounds. I'm playing two of them here. And then next turn, I'll shove this bronze weather back into my deck. And then I can pull it out with a third wild hunt hound. Uh, worst case scenario, I use Aridin to pull a wild hunt hound in the rounds two and three. So by this point, I'm pretty close to getting ready to pass. I have weather set up. I'm quite a bit of tempo ahead. He hasn't. He doesn't have too many combo options open, and he sets up one now. But I'm gonna. Use, I kind of want to keep this round going. I still want to win. I have a good through line to use my drowner to kill the enforcer, which is exactly what I'm going to do. If I can kill the enforcer and still like be ahead, I'm not too overplaying ahead, too far ahead in which I'm overplaying that I'm perfectly fine with going down this route and seeing now that he's uh, a little bit too far behind and I've there's some weather here it's a pretty safe pass uh, alternatively he could have gone he could have played one more card and then maybe forced me to pass then he goes one card down to win the round maybe but he, he declines to do that uh, I guess primarily because there's a weather and passing effectively clears the weather So I'm pretty lucky to draw into Wild Hunt Hound there. I can put the Bronze Weather back. I can use Aridin for something other than a Wild Hunt Hound. Now I just need to make sure not to draw into that or Roach. Of which I wasn't actually uh, accounting for. But So this is actually... I may have wanted to play out this round because... Uh, I don't know. No, it's better for me to go to round 3 so I can play it reactively and play out the weather more. Although there's something to be said about like trying to draw out, trying to bleed out my opponent a little bit more without giving up too much, but I don't think that's very effective in a control Aridin deck, considering this specific situation. Okay, so I don't want to draw into the two dead cards, so I just go ahead and not uh, throw anything back. Also, keep in mind I still have a first light, so if I do actually want to drown her, I can pull into that pretty reliably. And I don't need to risk uh, drawing to the two dead cards by mulligating back the uh, six strength guy. So it's kind of the nice thing about first light. It can be really reliable in these kind of situations where you know you only have a couple of bronze cards in your deck, but by chance they could be at the very bottom of your deck. But it doesn't matter because the first light would draw it will drag out a bronze card no matter where it is, right? Uh, so it can be pretty reliable in that sense. Even though first light is generally speaking kind of like not reliable, especially in round one, but Towards round three, when the game goes on, you can it's it's a uh, hit rate goes up by quite a bit, and still there's a very good chance that this kind of uh, Emir spy deck could be running gold weather, so it's good to keep a uh, first light in my hand. So this is another opportunity, like I just saying, uh, I know I have a couple genres still left in the deck, two I think, so I I'm very safe with, I'm pretty sure I can hit it on first light. Even if I don't, it's not that big a deal, but I'm going to try it at the very least. Use first light to bring out a drowner and then kill the six drain unit immediately. Yes, it's a hit. So why am I putting so much pressure on killing these units? Because these units gain deal two damage of disruption damage, which is pretty valuable sometimes. Uh, that is two two damage of disruption, which can be difficult to play around because you're just losing units. It can be a little bit risky if your opponent doesn't have any units, but I am very much going to be playing units. Uh, and for and also I don't want you don't necessarily want to buff up your own units too much because I have like card like Scorch and Igni. They're vulnerable to control options. So that's why a healthy mix of disruption and uh, raw strength is a good plan. So now looking to my my next move, I kind of want to play out some weather so we can get weather going again. I'm gonna go ahead and use Karen there. Uh, th I'm not actually sure if maybe I should have placed this differently if it matters if it's on the melee or range. But I went ahead and put it on the range. I think I was thinking maybe if he plays Cynthia, it'll be uh he'll stack this row up a little bit too much, but I don't think this deck plays Cynthia. Not certain. Ever since like uh more units have become agile, I definitely would have kept or before the un these Imperial Brigades were uh were agile, I would have kept them on the melee row because they can they only could have gone on the melee row before.
Speaking of which, I just kind of thought of something. So the whole agile thing is kind of an uh, it's I like it, but some claim it's an issue. So what if we what if you appease both sides? What if you are agile up to a certain extent? So, for example, Imperial Brigades could only go on melee or ranged, but not on siege. Or Karanthir could only go on ranged and siege, but not melee. Because, you know, he's like a lieutenant or whatever. That'd be interesting. You get to choose two instead of three. True Agile would still have three rows. You'd see a lot of that in Skoatel. And then units that are supposed to be on a, a specific lane would still have that, like um, the mage... The mages in general. And then you would have certain cards like Karen Thier and Parabrigades, which you could flow between two, but only two. Huh. I don't think I've ever heard that brought up. In my limited searching. But anyway, I think that'd be pretty interesting. Because also a really big issue with uh, trying to change Agile, or the lack thereof, is that it can be difficult to convey that succinctly to the player. But I... Like, so one of the things that people have been saying is that you have a, a unit will prefer a, a lane and then it will take like maybe minus two strength if it gets placed on another one. Right. Except that's really difficult to convey to the player without having a whole lot of UI elements and text. But if you say this can either be placed on the siege or the melee row, like if you just have two symbols instead of just one, then it's like it's immediately obvious. Right. I think that'd be interesting. Or at least food for thought. Uh, so what am I doing here? I'm playing Aerodin. My only real option is to play out this, this 9 strength guy. So I can do 1 extra damage per turn on that Frost. It's not that big of a deal, but it's good enough. Especially if there's like 6 more rounds left in this match. I really didn't have any other options there, I don't think. I think only the, like the six strength damaging guy, but this is going to get me more points over the long run. If I still had a wild hunt hound in my deck, I totally would have played it, but I didn't. I played all three already. So one thing to keep in mind is I don't have any more movement options. I can't draw any further into my deck. I can't draw. Uh, I can't draw any drowners out of my deck by this point. So uh, this seems like a mistake, but it's actually not. So notice I have two frosts here, and there's probably not going to be a whole lot of else uh, other strength aggregation or <laughs> or stacking uh, to get it over 25 points. So while I had this opportunity, I'm going to use my Igni. I just want to be safe about it. Igni could very well end up as a dead card. It's possible Igni might get a bigger payout if I wait a little bit longer, but I do still have a Scorch on the stack, so I don't need to worry about that too much. So I'm ready and willing to use Igni while it's still valuable. And hey, it's a 25 strength gold card, right? It really does not get much better than that, so. And so I kind of messed up here. I uh, wasn't really paying attention. I thought I still had my, my uh, Wild Hunt Rider. And I was going to hit this for three and then it would hit it get hit by three on frost. But I should have done the uh, uh, on the seed row because if it hits the seed row, it would still have a unit to hit. Whereas if it's on the range row, it would not have hit anything else. So it was kind of like a double mistake that ended up not really <laughs> effectively changing anything. But yeah, I'm kind of like hovering over my cards like where'd that guy go? That was supposed to, that Imperial Brigade was supposed to die. Man, he's gotten so many damn spies out. It's crazy. So now uh, this is a good opportunity to break up your hand. Am I going to use Scorch? Nope, I'm going to use Scorch at the very end where something lines up particularly well, but that's not going to happen for a little bit. Actually, I could have used it on this 9 and 9 to get 18. That, wouldn't, that would not have been half bad, but also I'm kind of waiting just in case he has like a T-Bore or something crazy like that. And worst case scenario, I can probably hit this Imperial Brigade, which still be okay. But hitting this 9 and 9 probably would have been fine. Uh, my second option is to use uh, the 6 strength guy. That's a, It's kind of a card that doesn't really get better or worse depending on where you are in the round. Uh, there's no particular units that I want to hit off of him, so that's a pretty safe card to play. I could use my mage. I'm still relatively cautious of uh, a gold weather card. If we get down to two cards left, I'd be safe with using it because at that point, his gold weather card wouldn't get much use. And even if I do use the mage a little bit too early, it would still be fine. 
Uh, so alter alternatively, I kind of want to save that one more turn. I can play on the next round and use it to just hit this melee row a little bit. And then uh, fourth option is to use Gaels. Still left in my deck is a uh, Dora Gray, and that's not going to be particularly useful. Uh, if he does have like a, a uh, what's it called, Rot Tosser, then I could potentially eat it, so I might want to save that. So let's just bake our behind, Scorch use for the uh, for for the very end, or wait until a good opportunity. Uh, Mage use it next turn, get L's just in case. Use it, save a little bit later. Use the straightforward plays first. Use the flexible ones later. Also, it's possible I don't re really remember my thought process. But maybe I was waiting for him to play this out, and that would have gotten three three nines. But that probably would not have worked because as soon as this goes off, it's gonna hit that up to ten. So I don't know. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, so this is the opportunity in which Igni would have been better. Would have been 27 instead of 25. Or it would have been 27 instead of 20. But it's all good. It's all good. There was no guarantee, like, I, I kind of took a, a bit of a risk, I took a bit of a safer play, and I got punished 7 points for it, but that was a risk I was willing to take. So there's Dorgray, still saving Scorch for the very end, he doesn't have any units lined up, he can still buff it up a little bit more for a little bit more value. And I'm pretty much just going to go with Wyvern, so I, I kind of was taking a chance here, I was hoping if I hit this, it might 50-50 chance hit the... Uh, brigade. I'm not really sure how that works. It might just hit the leftmost unit uh, out of two units that both have the same uh, strength left, but it would have been nice to be able to hit that as well. Or to be able to kill that. So he does that, and I finished it off with the Scourge. Good stuff. Oof. So there's a, there's a whole bunch of little stuff in there. Uh, particularly one, I used... Round one to try and play as many spies as possible because I don't want to play at round one if I don't have to. I don't want to overcommit to use my weather and then not have any weather le left for later. But still, at the end, he ended up playing spies back, so I was able to draw out the round a little bit more with a, a pretty healthy lead, so I didn't have to overcommit too much. Uh, going to round two, I just dry pass so I can make round three as long as possible. And going to round three, I made sure to use my straightforward place first and use my flexible place later. And in the particular, inst uh, uh, particular instance of Igni, I just went for the safe play since I did have a score left in my hand, even though I did get punished seven points for not using it uh, at, the re at the better time. That's it. That was a lot. A lot of, a lot of little nuances in this control area in deck. It's a lot of fun. Not very powerful, but... <laughs> Then again, I'm not actually using this deck to the specification of the Gwentelman, uh, Gwentelman deck. They use, I think I put a, put in a Woodland Spirit, but they use a, a Villain Trenton Mirth instead. Which I don't, uh, I, I don't, I'm not that big of a fan of Villain Trenton Mirth. It seems like its application can be relatively limited unless you're going up against a particular meta. And I don't think we're in that particular meta at this point. So I'd rather just go for a little bit more safe, um. Although I am kind of putting my eggs a little bit too much in the weather basket. So Woodless Spirit might be changed out. But Woodless Spirit is just so good at a base value. It just has so much strength. But anyway, so that's it. Thanks for watching.